All right, everybody, welcome to the webinar. I don't like to say podcast because I do a podcast too, but welcome to the webinar. It's an introduction to 360 degree video stitching. You're going to be learning quite a bit of information today. I do want to, of course, tell you about the Deliver Conference, which is happening in LA this June 18th through the 20th. It's a three-day conference designed for everybody that's interested in creating virtual reality, augmented reality, 360 video, cinematic VR, XR, all the R's. If you really want to get a deep dive into how to do it, and it doesn't matter if you know nothing about it, because we're going to start you from the beginning, and by the third day, you're going to have tons of information and a lot of knowledge for you to actually leave with and go create your experience, whether that experience is going to be a 360 VR video or it's going to be a full virtual reality experience. We're covering both sides. So I highly recommend you attend this conference. The cost is, is almost nothing. And if you have a company that'll pay for it, I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. For the full three-day pass, 795 bucks. Of course, if you use how to create VR coupon code, you can save 50 bucks on your three-day pass and hands-on workshop. That's me. I'm the program manager. I'm also the guy behind howtocreatevr.com. Our instructor today is Matt Raul. He is the president and co-founder of 360 Labs, but I'm going to be quiet right now and let Matt introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm the president and co-founder of 360 Labs. As mentioned before, I got into 360 photography in 2012 when I joined the Google Business View program, which is a program that allows uh, certified photographers to go into businesses and shoot street view style photography. Um, back then you had to be certified to do that in order to publish. And um, I actually shot my first pano testing for that program. Before that, I was a video producer and a web developer creating e-learning content. Um, but I really wanted to branch out and do more production, do more photography. So I took it as an opportunity to kind of start fresh and do freelance and get more of those projects and uh, met my co-founders who were also in that same program who had been shooting uh, 360 as well. And we decided to create a production company specializing in just 360 content. So we had the opportunity being early on to be able to work with a lot of great clients like Google and Columbia Sportswear and GoPro and Dell and um, Honda, other companies like that, because we were early to the market. We had a lot of big body of work and a lot of content that we created. And um, most of all, I just, I really love the format. I really love the medium. Um, I like shooting 360 above all else. So I'm just really excited when I get to come to work and, and I get to shoot this kind of content. Quick question for you before we get started. I know you love 360, obviously 360labs.net. It's in your name there. So we get it. But 360, one of the things with 360 is that it's three degrees of freedom, right? Versus full VR, which is six degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, do you think in the future we'll, we'll get to six stuff with 360 itself? I definitely think that we will. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that the technology has to come farther. Uh, we have to get we have to get better uh, volumetric video capture methods. We have to get better resolution, better headsets, better everything. But I know that eventually, you know, you're going to be able to sit in an experience and have a conversation with a volumetric model that or a volumetric video, and AI may actually inform even what they're telling you entire environment. So interactive content like that, being able to move through it and look around is definitely going to be a, a huge part of our future. I mean, that's what VR is all about, right? Creating the holodeck. Yep. I agree a hundred percent. In fact, I spent the whole weekend playing the Oculus Quest outside in my backyard, which is pretty big and full room <laughs> scale. And to me, it was the holodeck guys. That's the closest I can get to holodeck. So I can't wait for 360 feet. And I agree with you on volumetric video. In fact, my next Altspace VR event is going to be with Randall Kleiser, the director of Greece, and they did a whole volumetric video of You're the One That I Want uh, with Intel, and we're going to be talking about all that. So definitely, I agree that volumetric video is the future. If you have any questions about the webinar, feel free to email me, marcelo at howtocreatevr.com. Or if you have any questions about the conference itself, email the event manager, Stephanie, and there's her email, stephaniees at fmctraining.com. Originally, when 360 videos were first stitched, um, they had to be stitched frame by frame. 
because we didn't really have video stitching software. We had to batch stitch them in programs like PT GUI. So if you imagine a, a 30 FPS video is going to have 30 frames for every single second of video that had to be produced in 360. And uh, early 360 video creators had to do that. Thankfully, uh, that wasn't me. I wasn't quite that early. Because um, software came around like auto panel video as well as video stitch, which made it possible to stitch videos more efficiently, to take those video feeds and put them together and kind of automate that process. And when I started learning how to do this, uh, auto panel video was, I think, version 1.0. It was just, just coming out of beta and becoming a real product. And so it just made it a lot easier for people to get involved and do more. And then of course, the compact cameras like the GoPro Hero 2 made it easier for people to create 360 rigs. Before that, you had you know very few specific industrial use case cameras that were being sold to companies like Google and the FBI to, to monitor things in 360 or companies like Disney were creating crazy camera concoctions, but you really didn't have anything as a DIY person. But uh, GoPro kind of changed all that, made it a lot easier. So many of the 360 video producers today kind of learned by stitching panoramic photos to start with. And they use programs like PT GUI or Huggin to actually learn how to shoot or learn how to stitch 360 stills before they got into video when they realized that was a possibility when companies like uh, 360 Heroes and companies like Freedom 360 came out of the market and started developing housings for cameras. Uh, it just really kind of opened up that medium to a, lot of, to a lot of folks. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the anatomy of a 360 frame and kind of understanding when you stitch something in 360, uh, what's happening. And what we call this is an equirectangular frame. This is a representation of the entire scene in full 360 by 180. If you were to take like the, the globe and unwrap that globe and look at the world map, that's basically what an equirectangular image is. And so when you look at the poles, the top and the bottom, you can see that things are kind of distorted and stretched out just as they are on the world map as well. And so we call the top the zenith, we call the bottom the nadir, and uh, those are uh, your common 360 terms. Uh, these are generally two one aspect ratio. So a lot of times you'll see companies, uh, especially camera companies, say that their camera shoots 360 by 360, which is kind of, of a strange misnomer because it, 180 degrees is really all you have from top to bottom. So that's kind of how we usually explain it when we do that. So one of the challenges that came along with 360 video um, is parallax. So when we shoot 360 photos, we did use something like a panoramic rig like this one in the picture. And we shoot on what we call the no parallax point, which is a point in your lens that the perspective that you're looking at, no matter where you point that camera, it's always correct and it's always the same distance to objects. So when you go and you stitch that, you're gonna get a beautiful seamless stitch of a 360 scene. But when you're talking about 360 video, it's physically impossible to put all those video cameras and those lenses in the exact same space because they, they occupy physical space. So what, what that creates is parallax, which is the challenge in all stitching, is you know how do we get these perspectives to match up and look right? And that's why you get funky stitch lines and problems with 360 video. But the interesting thing is parallax is also necessary for 3D stereoscopic to get that depth and to see something in 3D. You've probably seen mono 360 projects and stereo 360 projects and notice the difference if you've used the headset. That parallax is what gets you that different point of view per each eye to create that. So it's kind of a necessary evil. And I'll explain a little bit more also about different video formats since we're touching on those as well. Um, 360 isn't the end all be all. Of course, there's 180 content as well. Um, you'll see a lot of people talk about mono versus stereo 3D 360. Um, the main difference is that stereo content is of course gonna require a headset in order for you to see that 3D depth. You need to actually have the headset and those lenses uh, to be, or wear 3D glasses to be able to see that content in 3D. Um, a lot of people, when they get started, they shoot in mono because the cameras are smaller, they're more compact, they're cheaper, um, they're comfortable. It's comfortable to watch mono content in a headset or on a desktop because you're uh, generally it's, it has less eye strain in the headset because you're not trying to correct for someone's vision or assume what they're 
what their pupil distance is. Um, it's easy to focus on, easy to watch. Um, and because you're not trying to stitch 3D, objects can also be closer to those cameras. So you can have cameras like GoPro Fusion or Insta 361 X that you can get a lot closer to and still get a good stitch. Um, and as I mentioned, they're typically cheaper. Uh, stereo 3D 360 uh, can be bulkier cameras, you know, can be um, much more time consuming and uh, costly for the producer as well because you're talking about much larger cameras um, and many of them have a minimum distance to which you can stand to the camera. So some of them are as much as five feet that you should be away from that camera to get a decent stitch. So stereo cameras are more often used for environments where you can stage the action, where you know where your actors are gonna be. You can block out the entire scene. It's not a, it's not a chaotic scene where people are gonna come walking right up to your camera or something like that. Um, VR180 is also worth mention and is getting a lot of traction right now, especially on YouTube. Um, it's kind of a compromise because you can do a stereoscopic scene that looks great in a VR headset, and if you're not concerned about what's happening behind you, the action that's happening in front of you is a lot easier to see, and you're only working with two lenses with those cameras. So it's generally, there's no real stitching involved. It's more of just a, a, a 3D calibration of those two lenses. And so it's a lot easier for you to stream that. It's easier on bandwidth. You're not having to waste all those pixels in the back that potentially no one may actually look at. So it's great for things like narratives, concerts, any, anywhere you have a subject in front of your camera. But you wouldn't necessarily want it out in a beautiful national park on a viewpoint, for example, because you're not going to be able to look around and get that beautiful view from all angles. So that's just a little bit about some of the immersive video formats explained. I'm not the kind of guy that says like one is better than the other. I think that if you're gonna work in this medium, these are just three different tools in your toolbox. And if you're gonna create immersive content, these are just your options. So always consider what you're doing and weigh your options. Talking about resolution in 360 video can also be confusing because you have to consider that um, Generally, your aggregate resolution happens based on how many cameras you have. So for this example, you know, if I had a Hero 4 and I was shooting at 2.7K, um, I'm not getting a complete multiplier of six times that resolution because obviously I'm, I'm cropping into those cameras. I'm taking out that overlap and those are melding together. And I get a frame that's closer to about 7680 by 3480. And Another thing to consider with those is a lot of times 360 cameras, the vertical resolution can, off, can often be a limiter, especially on cameras that only have one row of lenses. So you kind of have to consider that like with a small camera like a GoPro Fusion, you've only got two lenses. You're only gonna get a certain amount of resolution, but larger cameras are gonna get you much higher resolution. But of course, bigger cameras equal bigger parallax. So something like this Ricoh Theta could go into basically any type of a scenario. You could put it in a car uh, while you're driving. You could have it on a roller coaster and you know still not have stitching seams, but you wouldn't be able to take this red rig somewhere and put it right up in someone's face and expect to get a decent stitch with those lenses being so far apart. So there's kind of uh, pros and cons of going either route. You can go for higher pixel count. Maybe you're shooting for a, a dome or something that's gonna have a, a massive display and everything's far away and it's a landscape or you know maybe you have to have your camera inside of a dune buggy and you want to be able to stitch all that together without worrying about seams on people's faces and things like that so there's there's good tools for different types of use cases so talking a little bit about the types of stitching too um, a lot of people probably have heard the term optical flow and I'm gonna do my best to kind of explain what that is. I'm, I'm not really, uh, I'm more of a creative type uh, than, than, a, than a PhD, so uh, I don't really know the exact science behind it, but I do know uh, how it works for me and how it helps me. <laughs> so uh, control points, this is how we started originally when we were stitching. So control point stitching basically analyzes specific points or pixels in a scene and determines from one camera to the next, which of these pixels match. And then you're kind of blending those together in sort of a rudimentary way, which uh, usually gives you results like 
this example from Insta360 in this picture, this gentleman's on a stitch line, and you can see where the software is sort of tried to blend them together. And uh, that kind of produces sometimes uh, results that you don't really like. So he's kind of blurred up there. His face is kind of doubled. Um, you know, the software's trying to do as best as it can. But recently, we've had um, optical flow stitching has become more popular, and more of the camera manufacturers have started to offer that with their cameras, and tools like Mystica made that possible as well. What optical flow does is it analyzes the moving pixels in a scene, all those pixels um, in basically every frame, and determines where that motion's happening, and it attempts to kind of, kind of uh, interpolate what those pixels are in between those two perspectives. And so um, that can give you a much more natural look, um, like the picture on the right-hand side. You can see that he actually looks like a regular human, not a strange, blurry guy. And you can see that his features and his face and those things are not necessarily cut up. But it's not necessarily an, an, an end-all, be-all to uh, stitching. A lot of the uh, Camera manufacturers want to tell you that it's kind of a magic bullet, but uh, it can also look kind of wavy or it can look like it's, it's bulging or kind of uh, distorted if someone's on a, on a stitch line in an optical flow video. And I'll show you some of those examples when we get to some of the actual stitching of what those artifacts kind of look like. Um, sometimes I say it's kind of like a, a glitch in the matrix. So they, they both have their, um, their challenges and challenging shots that are difficult to stitch are really difficult to stitch no matter whether you're using control point stitching or optical flow. Um, they can always be challenging. As far as software options, um, there's a couple different ways that you can stitch content. Um, a lot of cameras today are gonna have their own bundled software that comes with them. Um, cameras like GoPro Fusion and Garmin and of course larger cameras like the Z-Cam, they have their own Wonder Stitch and Kando has their own software. And, the best part about these is that these are free with the camera. So you don't have to pay anything else. You don't have to pay a licensing fee or a monthly fee to actually use the software, which is really nice. Some of the cameras even actually do stitching inside the camera. And I've listed a few of them here, but I know there's quite a few more than that. So um, this can be helpful because uh, you basically get that echo rectangular 360 video directly out of the camera. But it's also limited because obviously your camera is not as powerful as your computer. You know, really computational uh, GPU intensive stitching processes cannot happen inside of a camera. So you get varied results. Something that you stitch in the camera in a Garmin, for example, might not look as good as if you took it out and used their desktop software. So you, don't, you can't expect the same results. Uh, I know that on some of them, even though they uh, stitching camera, they limit the resolution, right? So even if they shoot at 5.7K, they'll limit the in-stitching at 4K. Is that correct? That is a good point. And yes, they do. Like Garmin is one of those perfect examples. They do limit the stitching to 4K on the camera itself. So if you want to take advantage of higher resolutions and sometimes very often better stitching, you need to use the desktop software for cameras like that. But it's good to have options if you just want to share something really quick you know, send it over to your phone and throw it right up on Facebook on the same day. If, if that's the, if you're trying to look to do social sharing, that can be really helpful. Uh, but if you're doing a professional project for a client or something that you really, really care about the quality and you're concerned about that, um, then you are going to want to take that out and stitch it in desktop software. So professional solutions are also available. And, um, and as I mentioned, you know, the bundled software you kind of get what you get. You don't really have a lot of choices. You don't really have a lot of tinkering and adjustments that you can make. And I'll kind of show you today some of those things we can do with Mystica VR. Um, but the reason to use those professional solutions is just having control, control over the input, over the output. They don't care what camera you're stitching. So you can stitch multiple types of cameras, custom rigs, and you can specifically adjust the edges of each stitch and, and really get in there and, and take a detailed look at each scene and change what you want to, which generally pretty much all of these bundled softwares that come with the cameras don't do that, um, although they are specifically built for that camera. So sometimes they do get better results and sometimes they don't. And that's why we need to have options and professional solutions as well so we can get in there and really start tinkering with our stitch if we want to. Um, 
auto panel video is worth mention. It's been discontinued, but I have heard of people out there who do have licenses and may sell them. I don't know if GoPro goes after people for doing that or if they even care. But at this point, I mean, I still use it. I actually like it for rough stitches. It's a quick and easy program to use. Um, you've also got Nuke as well. And Nuke is more of a, it's more of a enterprise level solution. It can be really expensive. It's usually like a yearly license. And um, then there's a number of products out there and companies that do live stitching solutions if you need to take a feed directly from your camera and sort of broadcast that live as an echo rectangular. So from there, uh, let's go ahead and move into stitching a couple of shots. So I wanted to start with a fusion shot just to kind of show some built-in software and kind of how that works and explain kind of the limitations. So the first step, of course, is going to be ingesting your media. So, and I have that over here in this folder, but I'm just going to click here and bring that up. So I've, I've separated the videos in back and front folders here for this shot. You can also do this by connecting the camera directly, which is helpful. So you can basically use the USB-C cable and detect the scenes, copy them over as well as work on them at the same time. So that's kind of helpful too, but in this case, I've already copied over the footage, so we're just going to take a look at that really quick. Okay, so yeah, this is a shot that we took um, under a tractor uh, for a project we did for the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Association. Um, when you put this together, you already get a pretty decent alignment and stitch, but you can, of course, drag and drop and move this into place where you want it. Um, one thing that I will notice when I scrub through, and it may be really hard to notice on the webinar, but you can see that the tractor kind of moves a little bit. And this is a common thing that happens with these consumer cameras. They have uh, stabilization turned on by default, which in this case, it's a static shot. It's connected to the tractor. I don't need stabilization. So, but for some reason, GoPro's trying to comp or compensate and it thinks that it might be moving. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. And then of course I lose my alignment, so I need to move that back. And we have this great grid to show us where we're at. Um, leveling is, is probably one of the most important arts to creating any 360 content. Um, when the horizon is not straight, when you're watching content, it's real easy to see that something is not level, especially when you start to pan around and look backwards. So do pay attention as much as you can. When it first came out, Fusion Studio didn't even have a grid. You kind of just had to guesstimate. So it's, it's really nice that they actually added that, um, although it's not quite as advanced as some other software. You can change those manually down here as well, but I just like to drag and drop it into place. Let's see if I can make this, I don't think I can make this window any bigger. I can actually, yeah, so that way you can actually see what I'm doing here do that. So that looks fairly level. Just go ahead and make that smaller again. And I turned off the stabilization, as you noticed. Um, there's two different kinds of stabilization, and a lot of cameras have this option. So anti-shake is what GoPro calls this, and that they're just going to correct for any subtle vibration, anything like that. Uh, full stabilization is actually going to change the camera axis and lock that in place so that if the camera is rotating or moving up or down or whatever it might be doing, it's just going to lock that point of view in that same place. And so a lot of people will put like a camera on their motorcycle, and then they'll use full stabilization and realize, well, the camera's not following where my motorcycle's going. Well, that's because you're using full stabilization and when you turn, the camera stays where it's at. So if you want something to follow your location, you know, use just something like anti-shake if the stitching software allows you to. Another thing that's important with Fusion Studio is considering the color balance. You know, a lot of times I think that it tends to be very oversaturated and I shoot uh, in ProTune with Fusion. So a lot of times I'll switch this to flat before I export this, and then I'll use something like Lumetri and Premiere to add my color back in, add my saturation, and kind of dial it in how I want to. And you can change some of those things as well, like the color temperature. Um, but for now, I'll just switch this back to GoPro. So that's one of the other important settings you can do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add it to the render queue, but I'm not going to start actually stitching because I don't want to um, affect the video feed in any way. Exporting also. Um, is an important thing to consider. 
Uh, GoPro has it kind of like labeled out in different settings. So for me though, usually I'm either going to have one that I'm going to edit or I'm going to have one that is a rough export that I might just use to preview and do some editing before I actually do the final version. Actually, that reminds me, I kind of want to go back here as well um, and look at this timeline because there's one thing I didn't mention here specifically. A lot of people that go out and buy a camera like a Fusion will take it out and they'll shoot like a 45 minute shot and then they'll come back and they'll try to stitch the entire 45 minute shot and get frustrated because it takes hours of rendering time, potentially even days. And then of course they, they wonder, do I have to upgrade my computer? Do I have to, you know, am I in over my head? Is this 360 stuff just not possible? And uh, one thing to consider is that what you want to do is be able to specifically choose a selection in your scene that you want. So right here, like this dog moved from side to side, maybe I just want 10 seconds of that shot right there. So I can move this timeline and adjust that and decide like, let's see, he moves over there and then he's working on that wheel. So I can bring this in and I may want to only export just this segment. So now when I go to export, it's only going to export what I have selected in the timeline. If I have a 40 minute shot, but I'm only going to use 30 seconds in my edit, there's really no point in exporting and wasting all that render time on something that's going to be uh, just, you know, a 30 second clip. And when exporting, um, there's two things to kind of consider when you talk about exporting codecs. And so um, one of those is basically whether or not is this is a rough stitch or a final stitch, and are you going to edit it elsewhere? Are you going to add color correction or sharpening or visual effects or anything like that? And Fusion Studio gives you the option to export as a cineform which is when you, when you select editing, it doesn't actually say Cineform, but that makes it a Cineform file. And Cineform is what we call an intermediate codec because I can take that same Cineform file into After Effects and I can render that again as a Cineform again if I want to or as an MP4 without losing quality along each step of the way. If I do something like export for Facebook or YouTube, that's going to give me more of an MP4 and something that I can't necessarily, it's already got compression on it, so consider that when you're exporting from your stitching software, you know, do I need to have actual extra effects added to this? Am I going to bring it into After Effects? Or even if you're going to just bring it into Premiere and put it on a timeline, if you're rendering it twice as an MP4, you're compressing it twice and you're going to potentially get more compression artifacts. So usually for something like Fusion Studio, I will do something like a YouTube export at 4K, you know, and I'll just use the basic stereo audio. If I'm doing a rough stitch and I just want to see what this shot looks like really quick and just be able to review it, open it up in my, you know, file explorer and just check it out, I'll do that. But when I've determined specifically that, like, here's the clip I want, my edit is done and I'm ready to do my final effects and do something like that, you know, I'll do something like change it to flat color and I will go ahead and do an editing export and Cineform at the full resolution and export that because those files are going to be a lot larger too. So considering that, you know, Cineform is nice and it's not compressed, but again, if you're exporting a huge long shot, you're talking about, you know, many, many, many gigabytes of content that are, that's going to be rendered if you choose that selection. Quick question for you. Yeah. Do you have a render box that you send it off to or do you render locally or do you like queue them all up together and just leave it overnight? Um, actually, a little bit of all of that. So generally, we do render in-house. Um, we don't do a lot of heavily computational 3D models and objects and particles because we're not really that kind of a studio. So we don't generally have to use render farms for our content. But a lot of times, yes, if, if you can, you know, work it out in your schedule to where, you know, I can queue up multiple shots and I know that I'm going to leave the office and all those are going to run overnight. If I have a ton of Fusion Studio things that I want to put out, I'll put those all in the render queue and I'll have those set up. So, so yeah, a little bit of both. Cool. And another question that came in was, where is your tripod in this Fusion video? <laughs> uh, it's up there. So yeah, we actually uh, attached it to the uh, to the tractor. It's it's in there somewhere. <laughs> I don't Very even think cool. we did a remove on this one uh, because we just did a clamp, and you can't even really tell that the clamp. No, is you there. can't. Yeah. 
still. And that's the great thing about something like a fusion is that you can put that camera just about anywhere and uh, your rigging kind of just disappears. Yeah, let's move along to do something a little bit more advanced in Mystica. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this project. Um, one of the things about Mystica that is really daunting and confusing is this, this whole system of how they manage their files. So you have to create a project before you start and you kind of have to know what your output format is going to be. And you kind of have to know what your frame rate is gonna be as well. And so a lot of people who work on 360 footage what I end up doing is, you know, if let's say up, I, it's a camera rig, I don't remember exactly. In this case, I, I, I already know it, but let's just say I didn't. I can actually open up this file and I'm just going to open it with, uh, actually, I'm just going to look at properties. And in details, I can see that this particular shot is 2880 by 2880, and we are at 29.97 frames per second. So, Altogether, because I've stitched this shot before, I know that my S1 Pro camera is going to stitch out at about 5760. So I can add a custom size and say that I want my composition size to be 5760. It's going to automatically select this. Interesting thing about uh, stereo footage, too, is that regardless of whether you're doing stereo or mono, it's going to give you the, the mono height but you can kind of ignore that because the one that really matters is the width. If I were to export this out as a stereo clip, it would be 5760 by 5760. So they don't do a really good job of explaining that. And we already saw in this in the details that it was 2997, so I'm gonna do that and then I just have to give it a name. So I will call it webinar test. Go ahead and click okay. And then when this opens up, I'm presented with this lovely blank screen with nothing on it. So from there, I actually have to also import my footage and I've got my footage here. So I'm gonna go ahead and select my four video clips and bring them in. And so it's gonna bring up this lovely dialogue box. Um, if I were bringing in multiple clips and camera stacks, I'd have to worry about this, but this is not important just for exporting one clip. So I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And now I can see all four of my shots together here. I can move forward in the timeline and all those will advance. And nothing has actually been stitched at this point. So the first step in this case, um, if you don't have to sync, and this camera is a unibody camera, it's an S1 Pro, all the cameras are already synced. So it's great that today we don't have to sync as often as we used to, but they have the option. If, if you're shooting with something like GoPros or maybe Sony A7s or some kind of camera rig where you've, you've done, you used a clapper or something like that. You can audio sync here as well. And you can also time code sync if you have cameras that generate time code. But this camera is not gonna need sync. So I can go ahead and load a preset. And I can do that by right clicking here in where my footage is and select load preset. And Mystica comes with a lot of really great presets for various camera systems like your Insta360 Pro and your, your Candows and Kodaks and Samsung Round. And so you have a lot of great options and they have more on their website if you need more of them. But mine is gonna be this Zcam S1 Pro in the 2880 by 2880. I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. And what that does is load a preset kind of based on what I've selected and it puts those cameras in position kind of roughly at this point. So in order to kind of take it the extra step, I can also click to improve my offset, offsets under position. So what that does is just kind of analyze the scene and figure out where each one should be offset. And that already kind of snapped together a lot better there. So if I undo that real quick, you can see that was doubled up and then I can improve offsets and also under this button positions, I can improve angles. So that kind of puts things in a little bit better position than they were before. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make my bottom of the screen a little bit larger so we can see the rest of these details. I changed my resolution before we started because it's really hard to see stuff on a 4K screen. So we can also adjust the 
level if we need to as well. And so to do that, um, I'm going to turn on some of the layers that help me see what's, what's going on. So I can turn on a grid over here in the bottom. And that's a pretty detailed grid. I can see the center is kind of green. It might be kind of hard to see on your screen. And I can also see the outlines of each individual camera and the number of each camera. So camera one, C1, camera two, C2. And so this kind of helps me determine where everything's aligned. And I can look at the horizon. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the camera layers just to look at this. And I can see that the horizon is actually pretty straight. But if I did want to adjust it, there's a couple ways I can do that. I can control, click, and drag. So command or control, click, and drag, and move that where I want. I can also alt, click, and drag. And that allows me to sort of take a handle at one point. And if there was something like a vertical pole or a tree or something over there, I could line that up with this line and then let go. And then it wants me to do the same thing on this side so I can line it up with this building and kind of do that. And then once I've done that, I've leveled. And so still pretty level horizon. It looks like actually just showing that I made it actually less level than it was. So I'll fix that really quick. And then I can also click control and I can scooch that over to where I want. So let's say maybe I want the middle to be right on the door. And then again, like with the other software, I can control specifically what part of this timeline that I can export from. So right now there's nothing happening, but at some point a couple of Coast Guard pilots come out and start examining the aircraft and he's up there right now. So I'm gonna just come back to before he climbs up because that looks like a pretty cool shot. So here he's coming around. I'm gonna go ahead and I can mark an in point down here where I want that to be on this handle, which is mark in point. And then I can click on the timeline to go down further to where I wanna be. So he's climbing up, he's checking that out. I'm gonna wait until he kind of climbs back down. And let's just say that might be where I wanna exit right there. So I can select an out point you can also do a lot more on this timeline as well. You can, you can keyframe different uh, changes. You can you know, play forward. It doesn't play back at the highest possible resolution or not at, at the highest possible speed, I should say. Um, but it is a nice way to kind of play back your footage and it can even do that with optical flow turned on, which a lot of stitching software doesn't really do. It doesn't allow you to do that in real time. You have to render out a single frame or a test to be able to look at it. With Mystica, you can real time preview it on the timeline and actually play it back as you're watching. Now, so, quick question. You made an adjustment to the particular frame, right? You made all those adjustments. Now, do, do those adjustments auto adjust for every single frame or do you have to go into maybe 30 frames later and make sure that it's still okay? That is a great question. It does adjust for everywhere unless you set it as a keyframe. Uh, otherwise, it, it teaches, it treats every change as a global change. So if I'm changing the horizon or something like that, that's gonna change for the entire clip, for the entire scene. If I wanted to change that over time, I would have to animate that keyframe and set that up differently. But normally, you know, that's not something that's necessary unless you're uh, specifically wanting to change those types of settings. But they're global changes unless you specify. Um, Got it. And normally you would keyframe it if your camera is moving here, it's stationary. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And okay. even still, that's not really a good way to stabilize a scene. I mean, there's better tools for that too. So, but just as an example, yes, it, it does make that change globally to the entire clip. Excellent. And a great example of that too, is you can also match your color. If In this case, this camera, the settings are completely matched between every uh, between every camera because it's a unibody system. But if I was shooting, like I said, with multiple cameras and maybe they had slightly different white balance, I could use match color, but I can also use match color over time. So if you have moving footage with something like GoPros and someone's skiing down a mountain and the sun is coming out of the trees and you can use this kind of setting to match your color. So it's really similar to like auto pano video and how they used to have that feature as well. Um, and then kind of moving on into optical flow a little bit, you can see that I've still got some strange artifacting and like here, this is not right. So, but I haven't turned on optical flow yet. And this preset has a really large stitch feather of 100, which I generally don't usually like. So I'll switch that to 40 and I'll turn optical flow on. 
And you can see right away that up there at that top, at that uh, kind of piece that he's standing next to there with the harness on it, uh, you can see that snapping together with optical flow. And so that is where optical flow is actually interpolating what those pixels are and what they should be between those scenes. And as you can see, it, it does kind of warp things a little bit, but if you're not, like, it looks better than a stitch line in this case. It looks better than a blurry, doubled up uh, piece of the helicopter when you can actually see what's happening. And you can see probably back here in this building behind um, the tail of the helicopter will also change because that's way back there in the background. And so it's kind of confusing the foreground and background, but optical flow is gonna snap that right back together again. Also, as I was kind of explaining with optical flow, um, you can also have artifacts in optical flow that are sometimes even more distracting than uh, just a stitch line, for example. I'll show you, uh, you can also switch to more of a headset view and uh, like a 360 type of view as well in these scenes. So I can do, the, if I click on this button with this little VR headset, I can open this window in the top and I can look around in my scene. I can also play this back and make changes, but I kind of wanted to illustrate like what optical flow looks like when it gets confused. So in this case, I don't know if it's gonna play back super smooth, but you can see that the bottom here is kind of bulging and, and moving out. So that's not gonna be something that you know you want necessarily. In this case though, it's, it's on the tripod and I'm probably just gonna remove the tripod anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if that same bulging and, and pixels dancing was happening like on this Word US Coast Guard, I wouldn't necessarily want that. So I'd wanna find a way to either mask that out or remove it or, or fix the settings, which is great with um, Mystica because I have the ability to make those changes uh, so let me stop the video here real quick. Um, you can change the range of optical flow specifically. So in this case, it's set to medium and it, they have several different settings and other fine settings that you can change specifically with the optical flow, which makes it less or more effective in many different cases. You can also smooth the optical flow. So in this case, the smoothing is set on 10. If I set it to something like 30, um, things kind of snap together a little bit better on that tripod, but I'm also making stuff blurrier further out, which can sometimes be undesirable, and I don't, I don't want that to look like that. But at the same time, for this shot, I would probably just leave it the way it is, even though there's optical flow jaggies happening at the bottom there, because I'm probably just gonna paint this out and patch this in something like Premiere or uh, After Effects and just replace this with more asphalt. So you're not really necessarily gonna even see that issue. Um, another setting that you would often sometimes wanna change is the, let's see if I can get these guys to, to walk through a stitch line at some point so I can illustrate what I'm talking about. He comes around the side. While you're doing that, can you preview any of this using your HMD, your VR headset uh, live or no? Um, you can't at the moment, but uh, they're planning to do that. Right now they have a just this view so I can right. do 360. Um, but that's like something that they're that they're planning on adding. Um, but right. they don't have like, like, like Premiere the, where you can look at the uh, edit line inside the VR. Yeah, heads. yeah. I think that the the confusing part for them right now is like, well, which which headset do we go with? And you know, there's there's different ones that you can support. And if you go the Steam route, right. then you have to have a plugin. And of course, then that pops up all the time every time you open up Premiere. And so, True. yeah. So I can change the stitch feather, and you can see that the green line is the line for feather. So that also affects which parts of the scene are gonna get affected by optical flow. And you can kind of almost see what it's doing when I change that. So parts of the body of the helicopter kind of warp out a little bit and parts of it stay together. And for example, like if no one was crossing this line and I wanted this to look more natural, I could change that to a stitch feather of 10. And if he's coming across, There he is. 
And while you're doing that, I just want to remind everybody, we'll, our webinar is scheduled to finish at nine o'clock in about six minutes, but we're going to run over a little bit because we do have some questions too. So hopefully you can stick around. Um, I know, Matt, you're, you're pretty close to the end of this anyway. I am. Yeah. So the optical flow just gives you this more natural stitch line effect versus, you know, having someone who's actually physically sliced by a stitching line or doubled up or blurred like he is here. So even in some cases, pixels do kind of get this warping effect. It's, it's better than, you know, an opt it's better than having a physical line or a blurry line on someone who's going to cross that stitch line. So um, yeah, just kind of moving through some of the other things real quick. I'm, I don't want to get into too much detail because I want to kind of save some for uh, that session at Deliver Conference. But um, Mystica can also stabilize footage as well, kind of analyzing the horizon and trying to keep that in place similar to what Auto Panel Video could do. Um, edge points are a great effect that you can have. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back up again. Switch back out, show you what edge points look like because edge points really are kind of a game changer for fixing optical flow. Now, if you have a camera like a Candau or you have a Z cam or you have Insta360 Pro, something like that, their software doesn't allow you to do this level of detail. I can specifically say, you know, I want to emphasize this part of the shot and have more of this lens over here and I can move these points and I can even shift click and move this and make this smaller and specifically like let's say like maybe this jet intake thing didn't look like I wanted it to I can move this right over the top of that with edge points and control exactly where the stitching is happening in this camera I've got tons of overlap so I can pretty much move this anywhere I want and get a huge difference in my footage. So I don't really run out of pixels until like way over here. So I can really fix a lot of issues with edge points that I couldn't necessarily do with other stitching software. At some point you do get kind of a different color as it goes farther out to the edge of the lens. But it is nice to know like if, if a whole lens had a problem or something like that, you can use an edge point to kind of mask that out saving yourself tons of time that if you had to go into something like After Effects and manually patch in changes, you can use edge points to kind of fix weird stitching anomalies and, and problems or take out optical flow artifacts. You know, the, actually the tail of the, of the helicopter doesn't really look that nice. And if I did move an edge point out there, it may look a little bit more natural. So edge points are great for that. Um, but as you can see, there are a ton of different settings down here. Um, I can change the, the hue and the color and the uh, tint of every single individual camera. If I needed to make one darker or lighter, um, I can change all the different alignments, uh, various other settings. Um, I can change the color profile of the camera. If I'm working in something like, uh, you know, S log for Sony or, Canon log or something like that, I can specifically tell it that I'm using that color profile. So very powerful software, tons of different choices. But uh, yeah, since we're kind of running low on time and I do want to leave some time for questions, I think I can kind of just wrap it up there. First question from Antonis. What is good about 7680 by 3840 when a top Android supports 4096 by 4096 resolution? So maybe you can explain a little bit why higher resolutions in this sphere is important. Well, I mean, future proofing for one, um, that's uh, one major thing. But also, um, when you shoot something at higher resolution and then you downsample that to a lower resolution, you generally get better quality sharper quality uh, and we're often doing our visual effects and our our you know edits and all of our masters at higher resolutions because we don't want to lose that quality from step to step so we uh while you know we're not quite there yet to where the whole world can watch 8k uh 360 footage but someday we might actually get there and 5g is right around the corner but in the meantime when we talk about things like domes and you know massive video walls and displays like that i mean i just think that the more pixels that we can get the better because we want our content to live for a long time 
Right. And then on top of that, remember, there's the viewable area um, that you get to see in your headset. And then there's the entire sphere. So even though you have an AK video that you shot, that covers the entire sphere, not the viewable area. So your viewable area is only going to be like 3K anyway on an 8K video. Yeah, I usually so. tell people that, yeah, with, with a 4K 360 video, you're, you're basically looking at uh, kind of like 720p is what's in front of your face. So right. looking at 720p that close up, it doesn't look that great. Right, exactly. And that's where I think people get uh, confused sometimes that they look at the high resolution, but they don't understand that it's for the entire sphere, not just for what the user sees. So uh, next question. Oh, interesting. We'll see. I don't know if you can answer this, but what is a fair hourly rate to charge clients for video stitching? Um, You know, I think it really just depends on a lot of times. I mean, that's going to be your region. That's going to be your level of experience. I mean, we've had contractors with rates as low as, you know, 30 or $40 an hour, um, up upwards of hundreds of dollars an hour, 150 or, you know, it just really kind of depends. And, but we're in the U S market, so it may vary for your market. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of people also work remotely, uh, for cheaper prices as well. So it can kind of depend on that. But I, but I think that, uh, that's a, that's a pretty solid range that we've seen. It, it really kind of just depends on the contractor and, and their time and how in demand they are. Um, what about um, system power like specs? What do you need to do good stitching? Well, the GPU is really one of the most important factors. Um, you know, having um, an NVIDIA GTX, um, you know, we've got 1080s. We haven't upgraded to the, to the 2000s yet. Um, it's just one of those things, you know, you have to go back through and they're still working. So we're still using them. Um, but, uh, you know, I've even got an old laptop that has a 970 M in it and I can stitch with that reliably. I mean, I wouldn't want it to be my only choice, but when I'm in the field, I can stitch with it. So a lot of people say, we'll go out and spend like $5,000. You don't necessarily have to do that. I would also say if you can build your own, you can save tons of money and get yourself a really amazing machine. And you know, if I can add to my two cents on that, it's super easy to do today. Honestly, it's not that hard. It's just plugging in components together. You don't have to be a scientist. I build my own uh, for under 2K and it's got a GTX 1080, a core i7, you know, 32 gigs of RAM. You can save so much money and it'll be an amazing system. So I completely agree with you. And the great thing is if someone did it on YouTube and they have a build video, you know that all those parts and components are going to work together because that person already proved it. If you are filming 360, is it acceptable to bring in lighting if you are filming in a low light situation? Or do you feel there are specific 360 cameras that are better suited for low light? I I think that it, it is acceptable to bring in lighting, but you have to be really careful about how you implement that um, or you have to be willing to do clean plates. So if like, for example, you could light a scene and have lights placed in the scene and then you could shoot, uh, you could shoot it twice and then you could move your lights and have them out of the scene in the next shot and then composite those shots together so that in the end your light stands and your stuff no longer there. Um, A lot of people do stuff like that. Some people put lights on the camera. There's a couple products that are like light poles that go on the camera. But as a photographer, I don't really like those because light that comes from the camera never really looks flattering. So, uh, but a lot of people are are doing that and and I guess they're having some varied results there. But uh, personally, I I do like low light cameras, cameras that can work in low light, uh, like Sony a7, for example, people are building rigs out of those. Um, Zcam S1 Pro and the Zcam V1 are both really great at low light as well. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to get used to using denoising software too. Uh, like the, there's a plugin called Neat Video that uh, we swear by. You know, you're going to get noise if you're going to do low light. But being able to combat that and take that out in post is, is really helpful too. Yep. Hope, that, hope that answers the question. Yep, definitely. Um, these two questions are related, so I'll, I'll put it as one. What's the longest time you've recorded a single scene, and do you have any tips for recording uh, long scenes? Um, I would say probably for for me, um, I've done a lot of really long time lapses, but in terms of just live action video, probably only a couple hours at most. Um, running a a camera because we'll put it in a remote location and we have to start it and we have to leave and 
let something happen. So we've, we've done that before. Um, I've done time lapses that last as long as 12 hours overnight. My advice for doing that would be um, battery packs are really nice, especially USB battery packs. A lot of them can power a camera for multiple hours if you don't have access to power. Um, if you have access to power, of course, that solves all those problems. Um, having big enough memory cards, doing the math and understanding exactly how much capacity you're going to have on that card before you run out is really important before you start. And then uh, with rendering, um, make sure that if you're going to concatenate your footage that you're not having a problem with audio sync because that can be... Uh, that can be an issue with some cameras uh, losing audio sync, especially if you have someone speaking on a stage, for example, you want to make sure that after you run through whatever ingest process that your camera software has, check it at the end and make sure that, you know, the, the, the motions of that mouth moving are still correct for that dialogue. And if not, you know, you may have to troubleshoot and see what's going on. But thankfully, a lot of those kinds of problems that we had early on are kind of alleviated today. Yeah, and technology is just changing so quickly that things are going to get so much better mm -hmm. um, in the future, in the very near future. So, well, Matt, we are completely out of time. I want to thank you for taking the time to do this. I completely look forward to seeing you at the Deliver conference and learning a lot more about um, how to stitch really good uh, footage like, like you do. So thank you for this. Thanks for having me. If you do have any questions about the Deliver conference itself, please feel free to send an email to Stephanie. She's great. She will answer all your questions. Stephanie S at fmctraining.com. If you have any questions about this particular webinar or anything on how to create VR.com or the conference from the technical point of view, feel free to email me, Marcelo at how to create VR.com. And real quick, Matt, um, give him your email address if they want to get a hold of you. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, it's Matt at 360labs.net. There you go. All right, everybody, Matt, thank you again. And everybody that attended and took the time today, thank you so much. And we will see you guys in LA at the Deliver Conference.